Book 1, Chapters 16 through 18 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ethan Rampton. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 1, Chapter 16 through 18. Chapter 16 How Isaac Took Rebekah to Wife. Now, when Abraham, the father of Isaac, had resolved to take Rebekah, who was granddaughter to his brother Nahor, for a wife to his son Isaac, who was then about forty years old, he sent the ancientest of his servants to betroth her after he had obliged him to give him the strongest assurances of his fidelity, which assurances were given after the manner following. They put each other's hands under each other's thighs. Then they called upon God as the witness of what was to be done. He also sent such presents to those that were there as were in esteem, on account that they either rarely or never were seen in that country. The servant got thither not under a considerable time, for it requires much time to pass through Mesopotamia, in which it is tedious travelling, both in the winter for the depth of the clay, and in summer for want of water, and besides this, for the robberies there committed, which are not to be avoided by travellers, but by caution beforehand. However, the servant came to Haran, and when he was in the suburbs, he met a considerable number of maidens going to the water. He therefore prayed to God, that Rebekah might be found among them, or her whom Abraham sent him as his servant to espouse to his son, in case his will were that this marriage should be consummated, and that she might be made known to him by the sign, that while others denied him water to drink, she might give it him. With this intention he went to the well, and desired the maidens to give him some water to drink. But while the others refused, on pretense that they wanted it all at home, and could spare none for him. One only of the company rebuked them for their peevish behavior towards the stranger, and said, What is there that you will ever communicate to anybody, who have not so much as given the man some water? She then offered him water in an obliging manner. And now he began to hope that his grand affair would succeed, but desiring still to know the truth, he commended her for her generosity and good nature that she did not scruple to afford a sufficiency of water to those that wanted it, though it cost her some pains to draw it, and asked who were her parents, and wished them joy of such a daughter. And mayst thou be espoused, said he, to their satisfaction, into the family of an agreeable husband, and bring him legitimate children. Nor did she disdain to satisfy his inquiries, but told him her family. They, says she, call me Rebecca. My father was Bethuel, but he is dead, and Laban is my brother, and together with my mother takes care of all our family affairs, and is the guardian of my virginity. When the servant heard this, he was very glad at what had happened, and at what was told him, as perceiving that God had thus plainly directed his journey, and producing his bracelets, and some other ornaments which it was esteemed decent for virgins to wear, he gave them to the damsel, by way of acknowledgment and as a reward for her kindness in giving him water to drink, saying it was but just that she should have them, because she was so much more obliging than any of the rest. She desired also that he might come and lodge with them, since the approach of the night gave him not time to proceed farther. And producing his precious ornaments for women, he said he desired to trust them to none more safely than to such as she had shown herself to be, and that he believed he might guess at the humanity of her mother and brother, that they would not be displeased from the virtue he found in her. For he would not be burdensome, but would pay the hire for his entertainment, and spend his own money. To which she replied, that he guessed right as to the humanity of her parents, but complained that he should think them so parsimonious as to take money, for that he should have all on free cost. But she said she would first inform her brother Laban, and if he gave her leave, she would conduct him in. As soon then as this was over, she introduced the stranger, and for the camels the servants of Laban brought them in, 
and took care of them, and he was himself brought into supper by Laban. And after supper he says to him, and to the mother of the damsel, addressing himself to her, Abraham is the son of Terah, and a kinsman of yours. For Nahor, the grandfather of these children, was the brother of Abraham, by both father and mother, upon which account he hath sent me to you, being desirous to take this damsel for his son to wife. He is his legitimate son, and is brought up as his only heir. He could indeed have had the most happy of all the women in that country for him, but he would not have his son marry any of them. But out of regard to his own relations he desired him to match here, whose affection and inclination I would not have you despise, for it was by the good pleasure of God that other accidents fell out in my journey, and that thereby I lighted upon your daughter and your house. For when I was near to the city I saw a great many maidens coming to a well, and I prayed that I might meet with this damsel, which has come to pass accordingly. Do you therefore confirm that marriage, whose espousals have been already made by a divine appearance, and show the respect you have for Abraham, who hath sent me with so much solicitude in giving your consent to the marriage of this damsel? Upon this they understood it to be the will of God, and greatly approved of the offer, and sent their daughter, as was desired. Accordingly Isaac married her, the inheritance being now come to him, for the children by Keturah were gone to their own remote habitations. Chapter 17 Concerning the Death of Abraham A little while after this Abraham died. He was a man of incomparable virtue, and honored by God in a manner agreeable to his piety towards him. The whole time of his life was one hundred seventy and five years, and he was buried in Hebron, with his wife Sarah, by their sons Isaac and Ismael. Chapter 18 Concerning the Sons of Isaac, Esau and Jacob, of their nativity and education. Now Isaac's wife proved with child after the death of Abraham, and when her belly was greatly burdened, Isaac was very anxious and inquired of God, who answered that Rebekah should bear twins, and that two nations should take the names of those sons, and that he who appeared the second should excel the elder. Accordingly she, in a little time, as God had foretold, bare twins, the elder of whom, from his head to his feet, was very rough and hairy, but the younger took hold of his heel as they were in the birth. Now the father loved the elder, who was called Esau, a name agreeable to his roughness, for the Hebrews call such a hairy roughness Esau, or Seir. But Jacob the youngest was best beloved by his mother. When there was a famine in the land, Isaac resolved to go into Egypt, the land there being good. But he went to Gerar, as God commanded him. Here Abimelech the king received him, because Abraham had formerly lived with him and had been his friend. And as in the beginning he treated him exceeding kindly, so he was hindered from continuing in the same disposition to the end, by his envy at him. For when he saw that God was with Isaac, and took such great care of him, he drove him away from him. But Isaac, when he saw how envy had changed the temper of Abimelech, retired to a place called the valley, not far from Gerar. And as he was digging a well, the shepherds fell upon him and began to fight, in order to hinder the work, and because he did not desire to contend, the shepherds seemed to get to him, so he still retired, and dug another, and when certain other shepherds of Abimelech began to offer him violence, he left that also, still retired, thus purchasing security to himself a rational and prudent conduct. At length they gave him leave to dig a well without disturbance. He named this well Rehoboth which denotes a large space. But of the former wells, one was called Eskon, which denotes strife, the other Sitena, name signifies enmity. It was now that Isaac's affairs increased, and in a flourishing condition, and this his great riches. But Abimelech, thinking in opposition to him, while their living made them suspicious of each other, and retiring showing a secret enmity also, he afraid that his former friendship with Isaac would not secure him, if Isaac should endeavor the injuries he had formerly offered him. He therefore renewed his friendship with him, Philoc, one of his generals. 
and when he had obtained everything he desired, by reason of Isaac's good nature, who preferred the earlier friendship Abimelech had shown to himself and his father to his later wrath against him, he returned home. Now when Esau, one of the sons of Isaac, whom the father principally loved, was now come to the age of forty years, he married Ada, the daughter of Halon, and Aholibama, the daughter of Isebion, which Halon and Isebion were great lords among the Canaanites, thereby taking upon himself the authority and pretending to have dominion over his own marriages, without so much as asking the advice of his father. For had Isaac been the arbitrator, he had not given him leave to marry thus, for he was not pleased with contracting any alliance with the people of that country, but not caring to be uneasy to his son by commanding him to put away these wives, he resolved to be silent. But when he was old and could not see at all, he called Esau to him, and told him that besides his blindness and the disorder of his eyes, his very old age hindered him from his worship of God by sacrifice. He bid him therefore to go out a-hunting, and when he had caught as much venison as he could, to prepare him a supper, that after this he might make supplication to God, to be to him a supporter and an assister during the whole time of his life, saying that it was uncertain when he should die, and that he was desirous, by prayers for him, to procure beforehand God to be merciful to him. Accordingly Esau went out a-hunting, but Rebekah, thinking it proper to have the supplication made, for obtaining the favor of God to Jacob, and that without the consent of Isaac, bid him kill kids of the goats, and prepare a supper. So Jacob obeyed his mother, according to all her instructions. Now when the supper was got ready, he took a goat's skin, and put it about his arm, that by reason of its hairy roughness he might by his father be believed to be Esau, for they being twins, and in all things else alike, differed only in this thing. This was done out of his fear, that before his father had made his supplications, he should be caught in his evil practice, and lest he should, on the contrary, provoke his father to curse him. So he brought in the supper to his father. Isaac perceivest to be Esau. So suspecting no deceit, he ate the supper, and betook himself to his prayers and intercessions with God, and said, O Lord of all ages, and Creator of all substance, for it was thou that didst propose to my father great plenty of good things, and hast vouchsafed to bestow on me what I have, and hast promised to my posterity to be their kind supporter, and to bestow on them still greater blessings. Do thou therefore confirm these thy promises, and do not overlook me, because of my present weak condition, on account of which I most earnestly pray to thee. Be gracious to this my son, and preserve him, and keep him from everything that is evil. Give him a happy life, and the possession of as many good things as thy power is able to bestow. Make him terrible to his enemies, and honorable and beloved among his friends. Thus did Isaac pray to God, thinking his prayers had been made for Esau. He had but just finished them, when Esau came in from hunting. And when Isaac perceived his mistake, he was silent. But Esau required that he might be made partaker of the like blessing from his father that his brother had partook of. But his father refused it, because all his prayers had been spent upon Jacob. So Esau lamented the mistake. However, his father, being grieved at his weeping, said that he should excel in hunting and strength of body, in arms and all such sorts of work, and should obtain glory for ever on those accounts, he and his posterity after him, but still should serve his brother. Now the mother delivered Jacob. When she was afraid that his brother would inflict some punishment upon him because of the mistake about the prayers of Isaac, for she persuaded her husband to take a wife for Jacob out of Mesopotamia, of her own kindred, Esau having married already Basimath, the daughter of Ismael, without his father's consent. For Isaac did not like the Canaanites, so that he disapproved of Esau's former marriages, which made him take Basimath to wife, in order to please him, and indeed he had a great affection for her. End of Book 1, Chapter 16 through 18Book 1, Chapter 19 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 1, Chapter 19. Concerning Jacob's flight into Mesopotamia, by reason of the fear he was in of his brother. Now Jacob was sent by his mother to Mesopotamia, in order to marry Laban her brother's daughter, which marriage was permitted by Isaac on account of his obsequiousness to the desires of his wife, and he accordingly journeyed through the land of Canaan, and because he hated the people of that country, he would not lodge with any of them, but took up his lodging in the open air, and laid his head on a heap of stones that he had gathered together, at which time he saw in his sleep such a vision standing by him. He seemed to see a ladder that reached from the earth unto heaven, and persons descending upon the ladder that seemed more excellent than human. And at last God himself stood above it, and was plainly visible to him, who, calling him by his name, spake to him in these words. O Jacob, it is not fit for thee, who art the son of a good father, and grandson of one who had obtained a great reputation for his eminent virtue, to be dejected at thy present circumstances, but to hope for better times, for thou shalt have great abundance of all good things by my assistance. For I brought Abraham hither out of Mesopotamia, when he was driven away by his kinsmen, and I made thy father a happy man, nor will I bestow a lesser degree of happiness on thyself. Be of good courage, therefore, and under my conduct proceed on this thy journey, for the marriage thou goest so zealously about shall be consummated. And thou shalt have children of good characters, but their multitude shall be innumerable, and they shall leave what they have to a still more numerous posterity, to whom and to whose posterity I give the dominion of all the land and their posterity shall fill the entire earth and sea, so far as the sun beholds them. But do not thou fear any longer, nor be afraid of the many labors thou must undergo, for by my providence I will direct thee what thou art to do in the time present, and still much more in the time to come. Such were the predictions which God made to Jacob, whereupon he became very joyful at what he had seen and heard and he poured oil on the stones, because on them the prediction of such great benefits was made. He also vowed a vow that he would offer sacrifices upon them if he lived and returned safe, and if he came again in such a condition, he would give the tithe of what he had gotten to God. He also judged the place to be honorable, and gave it the name of Bethel, which in the Greek is interpreted the house of God. So he proceeded on his journey to Mesopotamia, and at length came to Haran, and meeting with shepherds in the suburbs, with boys grown up, and maidens sitting about a certain well, he stayed with them, as wanting water to drink, and beginning to discourse with them, he asked them whether they knew such a one as Laban, and whether he was still alive. Now they all said they knew him, for he was not so inconsiderable a person as to be unknown to any of them and that his daughter fed her father's flock together with them, and that indeed they wondered that she was not yet come, for by her means thou mightest learn more exactly whatever thou desirest to know about that family. While they were saying this, the damsel came, and the other shepherds that came down along with her. Then they showed her Jacob, and told her that he was a stranger, who came to inquire about her father's affairs. But she, as pleased, after the custom of children, with Jacob's coming, asked him who he was, and whence he came to them, and what it was he lacked that he came thither. She also wished it might be in their power to supply the wants he came about. But Jacob was quite overcome, not so much by their kindred, nor by that affection which might arise thence, as by his love to the damsel, and his surprise at her beauty which was so flourishing, as few of the women of that age could vie with. He said then, There is a relation between thee and me, elder than either thy or my birth, if thou be the daughter of Laban. For Abraham was the son of Terah, as well as Haran and Nahor. 
of the last of whom, Nahor, Bethuel thy grandfather was the son. Isaac my father was the son of Abraham and of Sarah, who was the daughter of Haran. But there is a nearer and later cement of mutual kindred, which we bear to one another, for my mother Rebekah was sister to Laban thy father, both by the same father and mother. I therefore and thou are cousin Germans, and I am now come to salute you, and to renew that affinity which is proper between us. Upon this the damsel, at the mention of Rebekah, as usually happens to young persons, wept, and that out of the kindness she had for her father, and embraced Jacob, she having learned an account of Rebekah from her father, and knew that her parents loved to hear her named. And when she had saluted him, she said that he brought the most desirable and greatest pleasures to her father, with all their family, who was always mentioning his mother, and always thinking of her and her alone, and that this will make thee equal in his eyes to any advantageous circumstances whatsoever. Then she bid him go to her father, and follow her while she conducted him to him, and not to deprive him of such a pleasure by staying any longer away from him. When she had said thus, she brought him to Laban, and being owned by his uncle, he was secure himself as being among his friends, and he brought a great deal of pleasure to them by his unexpected coming. But a little while afterward Laban told him that he could not express in words the joy he had at his coming, but still he inquired of him the occasion of his coming, and why he left his aged mother and father when they wanted to be taken care of by him, and that he would afford him all the assistance he wanted. Then Jacob gave him an account of the whole occasion of his journey, and told him that Isaac had two sons that were twins, himself and Esau, who, because he failed of his father's prayers, which by his mother's wisdom were put up for him, sought to kill him, as deprived of the kingdom which was to be given him of God, and of the blessings for which their father prayed, and that this was the occasion of his coming hither, as his mother had commanded him to do. For we are all, says he, brethren one to another, but our mother esteems an alliance with your family more than she does one with the families of the country. So I look upon yourself and God to be the supporters of my travels, and think myself safe in my present circumstances. Now Laban promised to treat him with great humanity, both on account of his ancestors, and particularly for the sake of his mother, towards whom, he said, he would show his kindness, even though she were absent, by taking care of him. For he assured him he would make him the head shepherd of his flock, and give him authority sufficient for that purpose. And when he should have a mind to return to his parents, he would send him back with presents, and this in as honorable a manner as the nearness of their relation should require. This Jacob heard gladly, and said he would willingly and with pleasure undergo any sort of pains while he tarried with him, but desired Rachel to wife as the reward of those pains, who was not only on other accounts esteemed by him, but also because she was the means of his coming to him, for he said he was forced by the love of the damsel to make this proposal. Laban was well pleased with this agreement, and consented to give the damsel to him, as not desirous to meet with any better son-in-law, and said he would do this if he would stay with him some time, for he was not willing to send his daughter to be among the Canaanites, for he repented of the alliance he had made already by marrying his sister there. And when Jacob had given his consent to this, he agreed to stay seven years. For so many years he had resolved to serve his father-in-law, that, having given a specimen of his virtue, it might be better known what sort of a man he was. And Jacob, accepting of his terms, after the time was over, he made the wedding feast, and when it was night, without Jacob's perceiving it, he put his other daughter into bed to him, who was both elder than Rachel, and of no comely countenance. Jacob lay with her that night as being both in drink and in the dark. However, when it was day, he knew what had been done to him, and he reproached Laban for his unfair proceeding with him, who asked pardon for that necessity which forced him to do what he did, for he did not give him Leah out of any ill design, 
but is overcome by another greater necessity, that, notwithstanding this, nothing should hinder him from marrying Rachel, but that when he had served another seven years, he would give him her whom he loved. Jacob submitted to this condition, for his love to the damsel did not permit him to do otherwise. And when another seven years were gone, he took Rachel to wife. Now each of these had handmaids, by their father's donation. Zilpha was handmaid to Leah, and Bilhah to Rachel, by no means slaves, but however subject to their mistresses. Now Leah was sorely troubled at her husband's love to her sister, and she expected she should be better esteemed if she bare him children. So she entreated God perpetually, and when she had borne a son, and her husband was on that account better reconciled to her, she named her son Rubel, because God had had mercy upon her in giving her a son, for that is the signification of this name. After some time she bore three more sons, Simeon, which name signifies that God had hearkened to her prayer. Then she bare Levi, the confirmer of their friendship. After him was born Judah, which denotes thanksgiving. But Rachel, fearing lest the fruitfulness of her sister should make herself enjoy a lesser share of Jacob's affections, put to bed to him her handmaid Bilhah, by whom Jacob had Dan. One may interpret that name into the Greek tongue, a divine judgment. And after him, Nephthalim, as it were, unconquerable in stratagems, since Rachel tried to conquer the fruitfulness of her sister by this stratagem. Accordingly, Leah took the same method, and used a counter-stratagem to that of her sister, for she put to bed to him her own handmaid. Jacob, therefore, had by Zilpha a son, whose name was Gad, which may be interpreted fortune, and after him Asher, which may be called a happy man, because he added glory to Leah. Now Rubel, the eldest son of Leah, brought apples of mandrakes to his mother. When Rachel saw them, she desired that she would give her the apples, for she longed to eat them. But when she refused, and bid her be content that she had deprived her of the benevolence she ought to have had from her husband, Rachel, in order to mitigate her sister's anger, said she would yield her husband to her, and he should lie with her that evening. She accepted of the favor, and Jacob slept with Leah by the favor of Rachel. She bare then these sons, Issachar, denoting one born by hire, and Zebulun, one born as a pledge of benevolence towards her, and a daughter, Dinah. After some time, Rachel had a son named Joseph, which signified there should be another added to him. Now Jacob fed the flocks of Laban his father-in-law all this time, being twenty years, after which he desired leave of his father-in-law to take his wives and go home. But when his father-in-law would not give him leave, he contrived to do it secretly. He made trial, therefore, of the disposition of his wives, what they thought of this journey, when they appeared glad and approved of it. Rachel took along with her the images of the gods, which, according to their laws, they used to worship in their own country, and ran away together with her sister. The children also of them both, and the handmaids, and what possessions they had, went along with them. Jacob also drove away half the cattle, without letting Laban know of it beforehand. But the reason why Rachel took the images of the gods, although Jacob had taught her to despise such worship of those gods, was this, that in case they were pursued and taken by her father, she might have recourse to these images in order to obtain his pardon. But Laban, after one day's time, being acquainted with Jacob's and his daughter's departure, was much troubled and pursued after them, leading a band of men with him, and on the seventh day overtook them and found them resting on a certain hill, and then indeed he did not meddle with them, for it was eventide. But God stood by him in a dream, and warned him to receive his son-in-law and his daughters in a peaceable manner, and not to venture upon anything rashly or in wrath, but to make a league with Jacob. And he told him that if he despised their small number, and attacked them in a hostile manner, he would himself assist them. When Laban had been thus forewarned by God, he called Jacob to him the next day, 
in order to treat with him, and showed him what dream he had. In dependence whereupon, he came confidently to him, and began to accuse him, alleging that he had entertained him when he was poor, and in want of all things, and had given him plenty of all things which he had. For, said he, I have joined my daughters to thee in marriage, and supposed that thy kindness to me be greater than before. But thou hast had no regard to either thy mother's relations to me, nor to the affinity now newly contracted between us, nor to those wives whom thou hast married, nor to those children, of whom I am the grandfather. Thou hast treated me as an enemy, driving away my cattle, and by persuading my daughters to run away from their father, and by carrying home those sacred paternal images which were worshipped by my forefathers, and have been honoured with the like worship which they paid them by myself. In short, thou hast done this whilst thou art my kinsman, and my sister's son, and the husband of my daughters, and was hospitably treated by me, and didst eat at my table. When Laban had said this, Jacob made his defence, that he was not the only person in whom God had implanted the love of his native country, but that he had made it natural to all men, and that therefore it was but reasonable that, after so long time, he should go back to it. But as to the prey, of whose driving away thou accusest me, if any other person were the arbitrator, thou wouldst be found in the wrong, for instead of those thanks I ought to have had from thee, for both keeping thy cattle and increasing them, how is it that thou art unjustly angry at me, because I have taken, and have with me, a small portion of them? But then, as to thy daughters, take notice that it is not through any evil practices of mine that they follow me in my return home, but from that just affection which wives naturally have to their husbands. They follow therefore not so properly myself as their own children. And thus far of his apology was made, in order to clear himself of having acted unjustly. To which he added his own complaint and accusation of Laban, saying, While I was thy sister's son, and thou hadst given me thy daughters in marriage, thou hast worn me out with thy harsh commands, and detained me twenty years under them. That indeed which was required in order to my marrying thy daughters, hard as it was, I own to have been tolerable. But as to those that were put upon me after those marriages, they were worse, and such indeed as an enemy would have avoided. For certainly Laban had used Jacob very ill, for when he saw that God was assisting to Jacob in all that he desired, he promised him that of the young cattle which should be born, he should have sometimes what was of a white color, and sometimes what should be of a black color. But when those that came to Jacob's share proved numerous, he did not keep his faith with him, but said he would give them to him the next year, because of his envying him the multitude of his possessions. He promised him as before, because he thought such an increase was not to be expected. But when it appeared to be fact, he deceived him. But then, as to the sacred images, he bid him search for them, and when Laban accepted of the offer, Rachel, being informed of it, put those images into that camel saddle on which she rode, and sat upon it, and said that her natural purgation hindered her rising up. So Laban left off searching any further, not supposing that his daughter in such circumstances would approach to those images. So he made a league with Jacob, and bound it by oaths, that he would not bear him any malice on account of what had happened, and Jacob made the like league, and promised to love Laban's daughters. And these leagues they confirmed with oaths also, which they made upon certain mountains, whereupon they erected a pillar in the form of an altar, whence that hill is called Gilead, and from thence they call that land the land of Gilead at this day. Now when they had feasted, after the making of the league, Laban returned home. End of Book 1, Chapter 19「Book One, Chapters twenty through twenty two of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One 
by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston, Book One, Chapters Twenty through Twenty Two. Chapter Twenty Concerning the Meeting of Jacob and Esau. Now, as Jacob was proceeding on his journey to the land of Canaan, angels appeared to him and suggested to him good hope of his future condition, and that place he named the camp of God. And being desirous of knowing what his brother's intentions were to him, he sent messengers to give him an exact account of everything, as being afraid on account of the enmities between them. He charged those that were sent to say to Esau, Jacob had thought it wrong to live together with him while he was in anger against him, and so had gone out of the country, and that he now, thinking the length of time of his absence must have made up their differences, was returning that he brought with him his wives and his children, and what possessions he had gotten, and delivered himself, with what was most dear to him, into his hands, and should think it his greatest happiness to partake together with his brother of what God had bestowed upon him. So these messengers told him this message, upon which Esau was very glad, and met his brother with four hundred men. And Jacob, when he heard that he was coming to meet him with such a number of men, was greatly afraid. However, he committed his hope of deliverance to God, and considered how, in his present circumstances, he might preserve himself and those that were with him, and overcome his enemies if they attacked him injuriously. He therefore distributed his company into parts, some he sent before the rest, and the others he ordered to come close behind, that so, if the first were overpowered when his brother attacked them, they might have those that followed as a refuge to fly unto. And when he had put his company into this order, he sent some of them to carry presents to his brother. The presents were made up of cattle, and a great number of four-footed beasts of many kinds, such as would be very acceptable to those that received them, on account of their rarity. Those who were sent went at certain intervals of space asunder, that by following thick one after another, they might appear to be more numerous, that Esau might remit of his anger, on account of these presents, if he were still in a passion. Instructions were also given to those that were sent to speak gently to him. When Jacob had made these appointments all the day, and night came on, he moved on with his company, and as they were gone over a certain river called Jabbok, Jacob was left behind, and, meeting with an angel, he wrestled with him, the angel beginning the struggle. But he prevailed over the angel, who used a voice, and spake to him in words, exhorting him to be pleased with what had happened to him, and not to suppose that his victory was a small one, but that he had overcome a divine angel, and to esteem the victory as a sign of great blessings that should come to him, and that his offspring should never fall, and that no man should be too hard for his power. He also commanded him to be called Israel, which in the Hebrew tongue signifies one that struggled with the divine angel. These promises were made at the prayer of Jacob, for when he perceived him to be the angel of God, he desired he would signify to him what should befall him hereafter. And when the angel had said what is before related, he disappeared. But Jacob was pleased with these things, and named the place Phanuel, which signifies the face of God. Now when he felt pain by this struggling, upon his broad sinew, he abstained from eating that sinew himself afterward, and for his sake it is still not eaten by us. When Jacob understood that his brother was near, he ordered his wives to go before, each by herself, with the handmaids, that they might see the actions of the men as they were fighting, if Esau were so disposed. He then went up to his brother Esau, and bowed down to him, who had no evil design upon him, but saluted him, and asked him about the company of the children and of the women, and desired, when he had understood all he wanted to know about them, that he would go along with them to their father. But Jacob pretending that the cattle were weary, Esau returned to Seir, for there was his place of habitation, he having named the place Roughness, from his own hairy roughness. Chapter 21 Concerning the Violation of Dinah's Chastity Hereupon Jacob came to the place, till this day called Tents, Succoth. 
from whence he went to Shechem, which is a city of the Canaanites. Now as the Shechemites were keeping a festival, Dinah, who was the only daughter of Jacob, went into the city to see the finery of the women of that country. But when Shechem, the son of Hamor the king, saw her, he defiled her by violence, and being greatly in love with her, desired his father that he should procure the damsel to him for a wife. To which desire he condescended, and came to Jacob, desiring him to give leave that his son Shechem might, according to law, marry Dinah. But Jacob, not knowing how to deny the desire of one of such great dignity, and yet not thinking it lawful to marry his daughter to a stranger, entreated him to give him leave to have a consultation about what he desired him to do. So the king went away, in hopes that Jacob would grant him this marriage. But Jacob informed his sons of the defilement of their sister, and of the address of Hamor, and desired them to give their advice what they should do. Upon this the greatest part said nothing, not knowing what advice to give. But Simeon and Levi, the brethren of the damsel by the same mother, agreed between themselves upon the action following. It being now the time of a festival, when the Shechemites were employed in ease and feasting, they fell upon the watch when they were asleep, and, coming into the city, slew all the males as also the king and his son with them, but spared the women. And when they had done this without their father's consent, they brought away their sister. Now while Jacob was astonished at the greatness of this act, and was severely blaming his sons for it, God stood by him and bid him be of good courage, but to purify his tents, and to offer those sacrifices which he vowed to offer when he went first into Mesopotamia and saw his vision. As he was therefore purifying his followers, he lighted upon the gods of Laban, for he did not before know they were stolen by Rachel, and he hid them in the earth under an oak in Shechem. And departing thence, he offered sacrifice at Bethel, the place where he saw his dream when he went first into Mesopotamia. And when he was gone thence, and was come over against Ephrata, he there buried Rachel, who died in childbed. She was the only one of Jacob's kindred that had not the honor of burial at Hebron. And when he had mourned for her a great while, he called the son that was born of her Benjamin, because of the sorrow the mother had with him. These are all the children of Jacob, twelve males and one female. Of them eight were legitimate, that is, six of Leah and two of Rachel, and four were of the handmaids, two of each, all whose names have been set down already. Chapter 22 How Isaac Died and Was Buried in Hebron From thence Jacob came to Hebron, a city situate among the Canaanites, and there it was that Isaac lived, and so they lived together for a little while, for as to Rebekah, Jacob did not find her alive. Isaac also died not long after the coming of his son, and was buried by his sons with his wife in Hebron, where they had a monument belonging to them from their forefathers. Now Isaac was a man who was beloved of God, and was vouchsafed great instances of providence by God, after Abraham his father, and lived to be exceeding old. For when he had lived virtuously one hundred and eighty-five years, he then died. End of Book 1, Chapters 20 through 22. End of Book 1. Book 2, Chapters 1 through 3 of The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 2, Chapters 1 through 3. Book 2, containing the interval of 220 years from the death of Isaac to the exodus out of Egypt. Chapter 1. How Esau and Jacob, Isaac's sons, divided their habitation, and Esau possessed Idumea and Jacob Canaan. After the death of Isaac, his sons divided their habitations respectively, nor did they retain what they had before. But Esau departed from the city of Hebron, and left it to his brother, and dwelt in Seir, and ruled over Idumea. He called the country by that name from himself, 
for he was named Adom, which appellation he got on the following occasion. One day, returning from the toil of hunting very hungry, it was when he was a child in age, he lighted on his brother when he was getting ready lentil pottage for his dinner, which was of a very red color, on which account he the more earnestly longed for it, and desired him to give him some of it to eat. But he made advantage of his brother's hunger, and forced him to resign up to him his birthright, and he, being pinched with famine, resigned it up to him under an oath. Whence it came, that on account of the redness of this pottage, he was, in way of jest, by his contemporaries, called Adam, for the Hebrews call what is read Adam, and this was the name given to the country. But the Greeks gave it a more agreeable pronunciation, and named it Idumea. He became the father of five sons, of whom Jaius and Jalamus and Corius were by one wife, whose name was Alibama. But of the rest, Eliphaz was born to him by Ada, and Raguel by Basemeth. And these were the sons of Esau. Eliphaz had five legitimate sons, Theman, Omer, Cephas, Gotham, and Kenaz. For Amalek was not legitimate, but by a concubine whose name was Thamna. These dwelt in that part of Idumea which is called Gebelitis, and that denominated from Amalek, Amalekitis. For Idumea was a large country, and did then preserve the name of the whole, while in its several parts it kept the names of its peculiar inhabitants. Chapter 2 How Joseph, the youngest of Jacob's sons, was envied by his brethren, when certain dreams had foreshown his future happiness. It happened that Jacob came to so great happiness as rarely any other person had arrived at. He was richer than the rest of the inhabitants of that country, and was at once envied and admired for such virtuous sons, for they were deficient in nothing, but were of great souls, both for laboring with their hands and enduring of toil, and shrewd also in understanding. And God exercised such a providence over him, and such a care of his happiness, as to bring him the greatest blessings even out of what appeared to be the most sorrowful condition, and to make him the cause of our forefathers' departure out of Egypt, him and his posterity. The occasion was this. When Jacob had his son Joseph born to him by Rachel, his father loved him above the rest of his sons, both because of the beauty of his body and the virtues of his mind, for he excelled the rest in prudence. This affection of his father excited the envy and the hatred of his brethren, as did also his dreams which he saw, and related to his father, and to them, which foretold his future happiness, it being usual with mankind to envy their very nearest relations such their prosperity. Now the visions which Joseph saw in his sleep were these, when they were in the middle of harvest, and Joseph was sent by his father, with his brethren, to gather the fruits of the earth, he saw a vision in a dream, but greatly exceeding the customary appearances that come when we are asleep, which, when he was got up, he told his brethren, that they might judge what it portended. He said, he saw the last night, that his wheat sheaf stood still in the place where he set it, but that their sheaves ran to bow down to it, as servants bow down to their masters. But as soon as they perceived the vision foretold that he should obtain power and great wealth, and that his power should be in opposition to them, they gave no interpretation of it to Joseph, as if the dream were not by them understood. But they prayed that no part of what they suspected to be its meaning might come to pass, and they bear a still greater hatred to him on that account. But God, in opposition to their envy, sent a second vision to Joseph, which was much more wonderful than the former for it seemed to him that the sun took with him the moon and the rest of the stars and came down to the earth and bowed down to him he told the vision to his father and that as suspecting nothing of ill will from his brethren when they were there also and desired him to interpret what it should signify now jacob was pleased with the dream for considering the prediction in his mind and shrewdly and wisely guessing at its meaning he rejoiced at the great things thereby signified because it declared the future happiness of his son, and that, by the blessing of God, the time would come when he should be honored, and thought worthy of worship by his parents and brethren, as guessing that the moon and sun were like his mother and father, the former as she that gave increase and nourishment to all things, and the latter he that gave form and other powers to them, and that the stars were like his brethren, since they were eleven in number, as were the stars that received their power from the sun and moon. 
and thus did jacob make a judgment of this vision and that a shrewd one also but these interpretations caused very great grief to joseph's brethren and they were affected to him hereupon as if he were a certain stranger that was to those good things which were signified by the dreams and not as one that was a brother with whom it was probable they should be joint partakers and as they had been partners in the same parentage so should they be of the same happiness they also resolved to kill the lad and having fully ratified that intention of theirs as soon as their collection of the fruits was over they went to shechem which is a country good for feeding of cattle and for pasturage there they fed their flocks without acquainting their father with their removal thither whereupon he had melancholy suspicions about them as being ignorant of his son's condition and receiving no messenger from the flocks that could inform him of the true state they were in so because he was in great fear about them he sent joseph to the flocks to learn the circumstances his brethren were in and to bring him word how they did chapter three how joseph was thus sold by his brethren into egypt by reason of their hatred to him and how he there grew famous and illustrious and had his brethren under his power now these brethren rejoiced as soon as they saw their brother coming to them not indeed as at the presence of a near relation or as at the presence of one sent by their father but as at the presence of an enemy and one that by divine providence was delivered into their hands and they already resolved to kill him and not let slip the opportunity that lay before them but when reubel the eldest of them saw them thus disposed and that they had agreed together to execute their purpose he tried to restrain them showing them the heinous enterprise they were going about and the horrid nature of it that this action would appear wicked in the sight of god and impious before men even though they should kill one not related to them but much more flagitious and detestable to appear to have slain their own brother by which act the father must be treated unjustly in the son's slaughter and the mother also be in perplexity while she laments that her son is taken away from her and this not in a natural way neither so he entreated them to have a regard to their own consciences and wisely to consider what mischief would betide them upon the death of so good a child and their youngest brother that they would also fear god who was already both a spectator and a witness of the designs they had against their brother that he would love them if they abstained from this act and yielded to repentance and amendment but in case they proceeded to do the fact all sorts of punishments would overtake them from god for this murder of their brother since they polluted his providence which was everywhere present and which did not overlook what was done either in deserts or in cities for wheresoever a man is there ought he to suppose that god is also he told them further that their consciences would be their enemies if they attempted to go through so wicked an enterprise which they can never avoid whether it be a good conscience or whether it be such a one as they will have within them when once they have killed their brother he also added this besides to what he had before said that it was not a righteous thing to kill a brother though he had injured them that it is a good thing to forget the actions of such near friends even in things wherein they might seem to have offended but that they were going to kill joseph who had been guilty of nothing that was ill towards them in whose case the infirmity of his small age should rather procure him mercy and move them to unite together in the care of his preservation that the cause of killing him made the act itself much worse while they determined to take him off out of envy at his future prosperity an equal share of which they would naturally partake while he enjoyed it since they were to him not strangers but the nearest relations for they might reckon upon what god bestowed upon joseph as their own and that it was fit for them to believe that the anger of god would for this cause be more severe upon them if they slew him who was judged by god to be worthy of that prosperity which was to be hoped for and while by murdering him they made it impossible for god to bestow it upon him reubel said these and many other things and used entreaties to them and thereby endeavored to divert them from the murder of their brother but when he saw that his discourse had not mollified them at all and that they made haste to do the fact he advised them to alleviate the wickedness they were going about in the manner of taking joseph off 
for as he had exhorted them first when they were going to revenge themselves to be dissuaded from doing it so since the sentence for killing their brother had prevailed he said that they would not however be so grossly guilty if they would be persuaded to follow his present advice which would include what they were so eager about but was not so very bad but in the distress they were in of a lighter nature he begged of them therefore not to kill their brother with their own hands but to cast him into the pit that was hard by and so to let him die by which they would gain so much that they would not defile their own hands with his blood to this the young men readily agreed so rehobel took the lad and tied him to a cord and let him down gently into the pit for it had no water at all in it who when he had done this went his way to seek for such pasturage as was fit for feeding his flocks but judas being one of jacob's sons also seeing some arabians of the posterity of ismael carrying spices and syrian wares out of the land of gilead to the egyptians after rehobel was gone advised his brethren to draw joseph out of the pit and sell him to the arabians for if he should die among strangers a great way off they should be freed from this barbarous action this therefore was resolved on so they drew joseph up out of the pit and sold him to the merchants for twenty pounds he was now seventeen years old but rehobel coming in the night-time to the pit resolved to save joseph without the privity of his brethren and when upon his calling to him he made no answer he was afraid that they had destroyed him after he was gone of which he complained to his brethren but when they had told him what they had done rehobel left off his mourning when joseph's brethren had done thus to him they considered what they should do to escape the suspicions of their father now they had taken away from joseph the coat which he had on when he came to see them at the time they let him down into the pit so they thought proper to tear that coat to pieces and to dip it into goat's blood and then to carry it and show it to their father that he might believe he was destroyed by wild beasts and when they had so done they came to the old man but this not till what had happened to his son had already come to his knowledge then they said that they had not seen joseph nor knew what mishap had befallen him but that they had found his coat bloody and torn to pieces whence they had a suspicion that he had fallen among wild beasts and so perished if that was the coat he had on when he came from home now jacob had before some better hopes that his son was only made a captive but now he laid aside that notion and supposed that this coat was an evident argument that he was dead for he well remembered that this was the coat he had on when he sent him to his brethren so he hereafter lamented the lad as now dead and as if he had been the father of no more than one without taking any comfort in the rest and so he was also affected with his misfortune before he met with joseph's brethren when he also conjectured that joseph was destroyed by wild beasts he sat down also clothed in sackcloth and in heavy affliction insomuch that he found no ease when his sons comforted him neither did his pains remit by length of time end of book two chapters one through three Book Two, Chapters Four and Five of *The Antiquities of the Jews*, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. *The Antiquities of the Jews*, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Two, Chapters Four and Five. Chapter Four, Concerning the Signal Chastity of Joseph now potiphar an egyptian who was chief cook to king pharaoh bought joseph of the merchants who sold him to him he had him in the greatest honor and taught him the learning that became a free man and gave him leave to make use of a diet better than was allotted to slaves he entrusted also the care of his house to him so he enjoyed these advantages yet did not he leave that virtue which he had before upon such a change of his condition but he demonstrated that wisdom was able to govern the uneasy passions of life in such as have it in reality and do not only put it on for a show under a present state of prosperity for when his master's wife was fallen in love with him both on account of his beauty of body and his dexterous management of affairs and supposed that if she should make it known to him she could easily persuade him to come and lie with her and that he would look upon it as a piece of happy fortune that his mistress should entreat him as regarding that state of slavery he was in and not his moral character which continued after his condition was changed so she made known her naughty inclinations and spake to him about lying with her 
However, he rejected her entreaties, not thinking it agreeable to religion to yield so far to her, as to do what would tend to the affront and injury of him that purchased him, and had vouchsafed him so great honors. He, on the contrary, exhorted her to govern that passion, and laid before her the impossibility of her obtaining her desires, which he thought might be conquered if she had no hope of succeeding. And he said that as to himself he would endure anything whatever before he would be persuaded to it. For although it was fit for a slave as he was to do nothing contrary to his mistress, he might well be excused in a case where the contradiction was to such sort of commands only. But this opposition of Joseph, when she did not expect it, made her still more violent in her love to him, and as she was sorely beset with this naughty passion, so she resolved to compass her design by a second attempt. When, therefore, there was a public festival coming on, in which it was the custom for women to come to the public solemnity, she pretended to her husband that she was sick, as contriving an opportunity for solitude and leisure, that she might entreat Joseph again. Which opportunity being obtained, she used more kind words to him than before and said that it had been good for him to have yielded to her first solicitation and to have given her no repulse both because of the reverence he ought to bear to her dignity who solicited him and because of the vehemence of her passion by which she was forced though she were his mistress to condescend beneath her dignity but that he may now by taking more prudent advice wipe off the imputation of his former folly for whether it were that he expected the repetition of her solicitations she had now made and that with greater earnestness than before, for that she had pretended sickness on this very account, and had preferred his conversation before the festival and its solemnity, or whether he opposed her former discourses, as not believing she could be in earnest. She now gave him sufficient security, by thus repeating her application, that she meant not in the least by fraud to impose upon him, and assured him that if he complied with her affections, he might expect the enjoyment of the advantages he already had and if he were submissive to her he should have still greater advantages but that he must look for revenge and hatred from her in case he rejected her desires and preferred the reputation of chastity before his mistress for that he would gain nothing by such procedure because she would then become his accuser and would falsely pretend to her husband that he had attempted her chastity and that potiphar would hearken to her words rather than to his let his be ever so agreeable to the truth when the woman had said thus, and even with tears in her eyes, neither did pity dissuade Joseph from his chastity, nor did fear compel him to a compliance with her, but he opposed her solicitations, and did not yield to her threatenings, and was afraid to do an ill thing, and chose to undergo the sharpest punishment rather than to enjoy his present advantages, by doing what his own conscience knew would justly deserve that he should die for it. He also put her in mind that she was a married woman, and that she ought to cohabit with her husband only, and desired her to suffer these considerations to have more weight with her than the short pleasure of lustful dalliance, which would bring her to repentance afterwards, would cause trouble to her, and yet would not amend what had been done amiss. He also suggested to her the fear she would be in lest they should be caught, and that the advantage of concealment was uncertain, and that only while the wickedness was not known would there be any quiet for them but that she might have the enjoyment of her husband's company without any danger and he told her that in the company of her husband she might have great boldness from a good conscience both before god and before men nay that she would act better like his mistress and make use of her authority over him better while she persisted in her chastity than when they were both ashamed for what wickedness they had been guilty of and that it is much better to a life well and known to have been so than upon the hopes of the concealment of evil practices joseph by saying this and more tried to restrain the violent passion of the woman and to reduce her affections within the rules of reason but she grew more ungovernable and earnest in the matter and since she despaired of persuading him she laid her hands upon him and had a mind to force him but as soon as joseph had got away from her anger leaving also his garment with her for he left that to her and leaped out of her chamber she was greatly afraid lest he should discover her lewdness to her husband and greatly troubled at the affront he had offered her so she resolved to be beforehand with him and to accuse joseph falsely to potiphar and by that means to revenge herself on him for his pride and contempt of her and she thought it a wise thing in itself and also becoming a woman thus to prevent his accusation accordingly she sat sorrowful and in confusion framing herself so hypocritically and angrily that the sorrow which was really for her being disappointed of her lust might appear to be for the attempt upon her chastity 
so that when her husband came home and was disturbed at the sight of her and inquired what was the cause of the disorder she was in she began to accuse joseph and o husband said she mayst thou not live a day longer if thou dost not punish the wicked slave who has desired to defile thy bed who has neither minded who he was when he came to our house so as to behave himself with modesty nor has he been mindful of what favors he had received from thy bounty as he must be an ungrateful man indeed unless he in every respect carry himself in a manner agreeable to us this man i say laid a private design to abuse thy wife and this at the time of a festival observing when thou wouldst be absent so that it is now clear that his modesty as it appeared to be formerly was only because of the restraint he was in out of fear of thee but that he was not really of a good disposition this has been occasioned by his being advanced to honor beyond what he deserved and what he hoped for insomuch that he concluded that he who was deemed fit to be trusted with thy estate and the government of thy family and was preferred above thy eldest servants might be allowed to touch thy wife also thus when she had ended her discourse she showed him his garment as if he then left it with her when he attempted to force her but potiphar not being able to disbelieve what his wife's tears showed and what his wife said and what he saw himself and being seduced by his love to his wife did not set himself about the examination of the truth but taking it for granted that his wife was a modest woman and condemning joseph as a wicked man he threw him into the malefactor's prison and had a still higher opinion of his wife and bear her witness that she was a woman of a becoming modesty and chastity chapter five what things befell joseph in prison now joseph commending all his affairs to god did not betake himself to make his defence nor to give an account of the exact circumstances of the fact but silently underwent the bonds and the distress he was in firmly believing that god who knew the cause of his affliction and the truth of the fact would be more powerful than those that inflicted the punishments upon him a proof of whose providence he quickly received for the keeper of the prison taking notice of his care and fidelity in the affairs he had set him about and the dignity of his countenance relaxed his bonds and thereby made his heavy calamity lighter and more supportable to him he also permitted him to make use of a diet better than that of the rest of the prisoners now as his fellow prisoners when their hard labors were over fell to discoursing one among another as is usual in such as are equal sufferers and to inquire one of another what were the occasions of their being condemned to a prison among them the king's cupbearer and one that had been respected by him was put in bonds upon the king's anger at him this man was under the same bonds with joseph and grew more familiar with him and upon his observing that joseph had a better understanding than the rest had he told him of a dream he had and desired he would interpret its meaning complaining that besides the afflictions he underwent from the king god did also add to him trouble from his dreams he therefore said that in his sleep he saw three clusters of grapes hanging upon three branches of a vine large already and ripe for gathering and that he squeezed them into a cup which the king held in his hand and when he had strained the wine he gave it to the king to drink and that he received it from him with a pleasant countenance this he said was what he saw and he desired joseph that if he had any portion of understanding in such matters he would tell him what this vision foretold who bid him be of good cheer and expect to be loosed from his bonds in three days time because the king desired his service and was about to restore him to it again for he let him know that god bestows the fruit of the vine upon men for good which wine is poured out to him and is the pledge of fidelity and mutual confidence among men and puts an end to their quarrels takes away passion and grief out of the minds of them that use it and makes them cheerful thou sayest that thou didst squeeze this wine from three clusters of grapes with thine hands and that the king received it know therefore that this vision is for thy good and foretells a release from thy present distress within the same number of days as the branches had whence thou gatheredst thy grapes in thy sleep however remember what prosperity i have foretold thee when thou hast found it true by experience and when thou art in authority do not overlook us in this prison wherein thou wilt leave us when thou art gone to the place we have foretold for we are not in prison for any crime but for the sake of our virtue and sobriety are we condemned to suffer the penalty of malefactors and because we are not willing to injure him that has thus distressed us though it were for our own pleasure the cupbearer therefore as was natural to do rejoiced to hear such an interpretation of his dream and waited the completion of what had been thus shown him beforehand but another servant there was of the king who had been chief baker 
and was now in prison with the cupbearer. He also was in good hope upon Joseph's interpretation of the other's vision, for he had seen a dream also. So he desired that Joseph would tell him what the visions he had seen the night before might mean. They were these that follow. Methought, says he, I carried three baskets upon my head. Two were full of loaves, and the third full of sweetmeats and other eatables, such as are prepared for kings. But that the fowls came flying, and eat them all up, and had no regard to my attempt to drive them away. And he expected a prediction like to that of the cupbearer. But Joseph, considering and reasoning about the dream, said to him, that he would willingly be an interpreter of good events to him, and not of such as his dream denounced to him. But he told him that he had only three days in all to live, for that the three baskets signify that on the third day he should be crucified, and devoured by fowls, while he was not able to help himself. Now both these dreams had the same several events that Joseph foretold they should have, and this to both the parties. For on the third day before mentioned, when the king solemnized his birthday, he crucified the chief baker, but set the butler free from his bonds, and restored him to his former ministration. But God freed Joseph from his confinement, after he had endured his bonds two years, and had received no assistance from the cupbearer, who did not remember what he had said to him formerly, and God contrived this method of deliverance for him. Pharaoh the king had seen in his sleep the same evening two visions, and after them had the interpretations of them both given him. He had forgotten the latter, but retained the dreams themselves. Being therefore troubled at what he had seen, for it seemed to him to be all of a melancholy nature, the next day he called together the wisest men among the Egyptians, desiring to learn from them the interpretation of his dreams. But when they hesitated about them, the king was so much the more disturbed. And now it was that the memory of Joseph and his skill in dreams came into the mind of the king's cupbearer when he saw the confusion that Pharaoh was in. So he came and mentioned Joseph to him, as also the vision he had seen in prison, and how the event proved as he had said, as also that the chief baker was crucified on the very same day, and that this also happened to him according to the interpretation of Joseph, that Joseph himself was laid in bonds by Potiphar, who was his head cook, as a slave. But, he said, he was one of the noblest of the stock of the Hebrews, and said further, his father lived in great splendor. If, therefore, thou wilt send for him, and not despise him on the score of his misfortunes, thou wilt learn what thy dreams signify. So the king commanded that they should bring Joseph into his presence. And those who received the command came and brought him with them, having taken care of his habit, that it might be decent, as the king had enjoined them to do. But the king took him by the hand, and, O young man, says he, for my servant bears witness that thou art at present the best and most skillful person I can consult with. Vouchsafe me the same favors which thou bestowest on this servant of mine, and tell me what events they are which the visions of my dreams foreshow. And I desire thee to suppress nothing out of fear, nor to flatter me with lying words, or with what may please me, although the truth should be of a melancholy nature. For it seemed to me that, as I walked by the river, I saw kind fat and very large, seven in number, going from the river to the marshes, and other kind of the same number like them met them out of the marshes, exceeding lean and ill-favored, which ate up the fat and the large kind, and yet were no better than before, and not less miserably pinched with famine. After I had seen this vision, I awaked out of my sleep, and being in disorder, and considering with myself what this appearance should be, I fell asleep again, and saw another dream much more wonderful than the foregoing, which still did more affright and disturb me. I saw seven ears of corn growing out of one root, having their heads borne down by the weight of the grains, and bending down with the fruit, which was now ripe and fit for reaping, and near these I saw seven other ears of corn, meager and weak, for want of rain, which fell to eating and consuming those that were fit for reaping, and put me into great astonishment. To which Joseph replied, This dream, said he, O king, although seen under two forms, signifies one and the same event of things for when thou sawest the fat kine which is an animal made for the plough and for labour devoured by the worser kine and the ears of corn eaten up by the smaller ears they foretell a famine and want of the fruits of the earth for the same number of years and equal with those when egypt was in a happy state and this so far that the plenty of these years will be spent in the same number of years of scarcity and that scarcity of necessary provisions will be very difficult to be corrected as a sign whereof the ill-favored kine, when they had devoured the better sort, could not be satisfied. But still God foreshows what is to come upon men, not to grieve them, but that when they know it beforehand, 
they may by prudence make the actual experience of what is foretold the more tolerable if thou therefore carefully dispose of the plentiful crops which will come in the former years thou wilt procure that the future calamity will not be felt by the egyptians hereupon the king wondered at the discretion and wisdom of joseph and asked him by what means he might so dispense the foregoing plentiful crops in the happy years as to make the miserable crops more tolerable joseph then added this his advice to spare the good crops and not permit the egyptians to spend them luxuriously but to reserve what they would have spent in luxury beyond their necessity against the time of want he also exhorted him to take the corn of the husbandmen and give them only so much as will be sufficient for their food accordingly pharaoh being surprised at joseph not only for his interpretation of the dream but for the counsel he had given him entrusted him with dispensing the corn with power to do what he thought would be for the benefit of the people of egypt and for the benefit of the king as believing that he who first discovered this method of acting would prove the best overseer of it but joseph having this power given him by the king with leave to make use of his seal and to wear purple drove in his chariot through all the land of egypt and took the corn of the husbandmen allotting as much to every one as would be sufficient for seed and for food but without discovering to any one the reason why he did so end of book two chapters four and five